when I think about national parks and I think about the wildlife that one finds within them, the word that comes to my mind is sanctuary. And the animal that comes to my mind is the bison. And the place that comes to my mind is Yellowstone. And Yellowstone, of course, is the world's first national park. March 1st, 1872, it was established, which means on that date, a sanctuary was created for one of the most magnificent animals in North America. And had we not created that sanctuary, the bison would no longer exist in North America in that wild setting. Because we have the bison, we have the predators th that also can prey on the bison. So there's so many other things that are connected with the presence of that animal, things that are obvious and things that are not so obvious. I think that the key to keeping animals wild in the wild is teaching the visitors who visit the parks and, and, and having them understand what wilderness actually is, what wilderness actually means. And when you're in a wilderness area, how is that different culturally, emotionally, than being in an area that is not wilderness? I think folks, if people understand the context, if they understand that wild animals actually evolve in a wilderness setting, I think they're more enabled to protect wilderness. You know, like we as human beings need a home to evolve and to become shaped by and shaped in, and animals are no different. So you can't have a wolf without a wild setting. And I usually kind of put it this way. If you're just wandering around in North America, you know, some folks have that tendency, John Muir, you just start walking. And if you're wandering around in North America and you look up and you suddenly find that you're in the presence of a grizzly bear, then look more deeply around you because you are also in wilderness. The same values and variables that in combination define wilderness are the very things that a bear needs, a grizzly bear needs, in order to, to survive and reproduce and prosper. So when you are in the presence of a grizzly bear, you are in the presence of wilderness. It is all around you at that point. When you're in an environment and you see wildlife, around you. You're seeing the, 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 that part of that wilderness that's most like you. I mean, people tend to, th to, to look, they tend not to look at, a, at an elk or a bison or a wolf or a trumpet or swan and see themselves reflected. But it is a community that's out there that is closer to us than insects, for example, or bacteria. You know, I mean, they're, they're doing what we do. They breathe in oxygen, they breathe out carbon dioxide, you know. So they're cousins, is what I'm saying. Those are our cousins that are out there. And I think there's this kinship that is something that is so deep within us that sometimes I think for us now, we don't have a name for it. So when you're in these environments, you feel that sense of kinship. You feel a little bit of fear, you feel a little bit of exhilaration, but you realize that you're looking at something that in my mind in my, and through my eyes is not just an animal, but it's a, it's a kindred. It's something that's like us, but different from us. And I think that that's very powerful. And I think what makes it the most powerful is that there's a recognition that, that, that you have become part of a community that was part of our human community for literally tens of thousands of years that now we have become divorced from. So we've come home, basically, when we we're within that community. And so when you don't have the wildlife around you and all you have the land, there's something missing. It's like a family reunion where you're the only one there and you should. Yeah, and you show up and you're, you're the first, you're showing up, well, where's not this and where's Uncle that and where's that? I mean, wildlife is part of that earth community that we are a part of as well. And you feel that when you're in a national park, when you're in a, a wilderness area. And it's important to have that recognition, I think, both consciously and subconsciously. And it's more powerful, actually, subconsciously. I, this is what I would say to, to a kid. Say, I'd say, uh, you know, you see a wolf for the first time, and there's a part of you that wants to pull away because you're going, that's no dog, <laughs> that's something else. But there's a part of you that, that is being pulled closer because there, there, I think there is such a thing as ancestral memory. There's memory that's encoded in our DNA. DNA is memory to some degree. It's a biochemical memory. And so there's something encoded in us that when we see that wolf, we see that buffalo, it pulls, it's pulling at us to get closer to it. And because we lived in a civilized way now, we live in cities and towns, we have become distant from the, the very thing that we lived in, in a cooperation with and in community with. And so I think that there, there's, there's this draw, this irresistible pull to get closer to any wild animal that we see. We want to reach out with our hand and touch it. But we don't sometimes recognize that when you reach out toward that animal, 
you are actually invading someone, something else's space, and just that effort of reaching out transforms and changes that space, makes it a negative. And the more you do that, the more that animal gets accustomed to you reaching out, and it actually changes its behavior as well. So we make that which we try to approach less wild in the act of approaching it. So every time someone walks closer to a bison, that bison, and nothing happens to the bison, the bison it begins to lose its fear of human beings. Whenever we walk a little bit closer to a grizzly bear or a black bear, well, if we walk closer to a grizzly bear, that's called insanity. But if we walk closer to a bear, that bear becomes accustomed to our presence because nothing bad happens to it, and it loses a little bit of its wildness. Wildness is not lost all at once. Wildness is lost in a series of gradations. And over time, it becomes completely habituated and it's lost its fear of people and that is the most dangerous kind of bear of all. A bear that has lost all of its fear of human beings. A fed bear is a dead bear because that bear has moved on that, along that continuum to accommodating the presence of people and, and not seeing people as something to fear and that eventually will get that bear, that bear killed because it'll, we'll, we continue to feed them and they figure there is such a thing as a free lunch. Yeah, and that free lunch kills them.